Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. Thank you for taking time in your busy day to watch our videos. I do pray that our studies in the Word of God and our studies in the history of faith be a blessing to those who follow along. Friends, we continue in this portion of history to show you of the Baptists. The Baptist churches that were in existence at the time of the Reformation and before and of their spread all over Europe as it were. They were everywhere. As we've seen in this history of study, even before they became known as Baptists, the, those of the Anabaptists were prevalent everywhere, and the more that they were persecuted, the more of them that there were. Now, last time we were speaking of the Baptists in Scotland and other areas of the Europe, European area, and uh, today we have, uh, we'll start in this section, or what is showing us here now is Bohemia. In the kingdom of Bohemia is a point of territorial surface, the most elevated ground, the mountains, are, and by nature the strongest in Germany. The country is about 300 miles long and 250 broad and is almost surrounded with impenetrable forests and lofty mountains. Bohemia derived its name from Bohemia which signifies the country of the Boi, a, boy, a tribe of Celts who retired into the Hinchini forest from Gaul to avoid the Roman yoke. The ancient inhabitants are represented by contemporary historians as a people of ruddy complexion and of enormous stature and muscular strength. Uh, See, so we have the authentic evidence in the writings of the Apostle Paul that he preached the gospel of Christ in Illyricum and that Titus visited Dalmatia. Hence the Bohemians infer that the gospel was preached in all the countries of Sylvania in the first age of Christianity. They also say that Jerome, who was a native, a native of Stratum, a city of Illyricum, was a presbyter in a church of Dalmatia, translated the scriptures into his native tongue, and that all the nations of Sylvania ex extraction, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Russians, the Wallachians, and the Bohemians, and the Valdos use this translation to this day. Now there are many, uh, as we've made mention some of these in the past, many other, many uh, translations of the Word of God in other languages after the giving of the New Testament books in Greek by the Apostles and then even some of them began to translate some of that over into other languages. Some began to translate it to the Hebrew. And some, even as they went forth, began as they were able to translate into some of these other languages. And even as this here speaks of Paul and, uh, I believe it was Titus up here, it said, yeah, Paul and Titus, who went into this region, preaching the gospel to these people in this region, that this one here in particular who had, had come out of that ministry also, began to translate it into language that according to history is still in use over there today in these parts of the world. It goes on to say, for want of records, we are this this <clears throat> we to, uh, to pass over the early state and history of this people necessitated. We are necessitated to pass over the early state and history of this people. And, and we have to say this too, that the, the want of records the evidence of the past. Roman Catholicism, from its early ages, determined to destroy everything they could. They determined to destroy all the books they could, even as they were destroying the people. And not only was it destroying the books and the writings of the truth, but it then it set out to keep the writings, keep the truth out of the hands of the people. But by the sovereign purpose of God, sovereign plan and purpose of God, God brought division even amongst that their organization. And as we are seeing it in the periods of history that where the Greek church separated itself from 
the east of, from the uh, Spanish side of things, or the Latin. And whereas Rome said, oh, it's, you got to keep the Latin and keep it, you got to have it in Latin and keep it in Latin, they said, no, we've got Greek text and we're going to keep those Greek texts. And that was part of the plan and purpose of God as we have seen in history. And they kept those Greek texts, and then before Constantinople fell, they took those Greek texts and went to the north and to the west. And that there in turn in history made those Greek texts available unto others, even unto Luther himself, who had been reading those texts at the time of the Reformation. And he was under conviction of what was in those Greek texts and the great difference therein from what he had been taught by the Roman Catholicism and it helped to bring him and others out. And as we all know, it is those same Greek texts that our King James Bible is made from. Now, here again, the, the history of these and others are lost because of the deliberate destruction of written materials by Roman Catholicism and yes, later the Reformers Protestants, it says it is not important, it is not improbable that some of the Vados who left Spain on the invasion of the Moors reached Bohemia, since reference it is often made to their descendants and their manner of attending the ordinances. This here, these past uh, three paragraphs we've read all from the History of Baptists by Orchard. In 1457, we find the United Brethren. These brethren bound themselves to a vigorous discipline in church affairs and not to defend themselves with the sword, but suffer the loss of all for conscience sake. And again, uh, we have seen this idea and this attitude throughout history. Brethren, we've lost something nearly in this. That today, and I, even some of you out there that I see on Facebook, online, you're talking about the threat of persecution. And uh, some of you are acting like, oh, I, they're threatening to kill me, but God's going to do what he can to preserve my life. Friends, do you not realize that that's contrary to what scriptures teach you? That you ought to rejoice to be counted worthy to suffer persecution, if it even be persecution unto death? We've lost something. We've lost the desire to yield ourselves uh, as a living sacrifice unto God, even if it be unto death in the face of those that would persecute and hate us for the glory of Christ. Uh, I can see, yes, none of us really wants to be hurt or die. None of us wants to see our friends or family suffer either. But the Bible says that if you suffer such persecution, you've been counted worthy to receive it by God himself. He's allowed it to come upon you that you might be able to bear witness to them of your faith even in the face of death, even unto death, as you would die by some whatever means they might bring upon you, but yet be praising God and saying, God have mercy upon these who are killing me. Show them the truth that they might believe also. That has been the witness throughout history of those who were persecuted unto death, that they wanted God to open the eyes of those who were persecuting them. And if by giving their lives to the, to the persecutor would do it, they were more than willing to yield their life to the glory of Christ. May God help us, because I know that there is a time coming again like that very self-same thing. During the great tribulation, friends, they're going to be cutting your heads off. You that are out there today that hear, may hear the gospel message and say, oh, I don't really know about this, I don't know if I believe that. And then if you do... Delay it. You put it off. There are going to be great multitudes, I believe, all over the world, from all nations that are saved in great tribulation that will, yes, they will lose their heads for Christ. Anyway, we go on to read here. In 1459, these godly people. Now we might make note here that yes, these writings and others that are referred to, refer to all these people in this line of history as being a godly, pious people. And in the writings of Roman Catholicism, you find that, and you find contradictory writings that want to say that they're an ungodly people. But most of the time when you see that they're, that's the opinion of the persecutor, 
Because why do they think that why do they think they're ungodly? Because they would not acknowledge Roman Catholicism as the true church and the Pope of Rome as the head of it. They refused to acknowledge his leadership. And they looked to Christ alone to govern and lead them and his word to be their pattern in all things of faith and practice. And anything that Rome could say that would be contradictory to that, they vehemently said, no, we will not bow the knee to men, but we will live and we will obey God. And that is, indeed is what we ought to do. But they were, the, 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 this is the witness that they were a godly people. And now there are just one or two exceptions to this pattern, this example, that we've also found in history. Uh, there were, was at least one time when there was a group of them that sought to defend a city which they were in from siege. And there was another time when another group of them, because their leader had been murdered by the Catholics, they guaranteed his safety. They guaranteed his a safe passage. He was a leader. He was a king. And they had guaranteed safe passage to come and have conference with them. And when he came, then they murdered him. That's not of God. They lied. And then they murdered a man who they guaranteed his safety. And that led to that nation which he represented going to war against them because of what they'd done. Sadly, in the end, that nation bowed its knee to that Roman power. They did what they did. But yet there were still holdouts among them that did not. Going on again, these godly people made all classes Obtained from the, their king, progibers. Some of these words I know. Some of that, sometimes these words I'm not pronouncing right, but y'all can figure them out in the, right, in the listing down below. A place to worship in, where they established a society on the model of primitive simplicity. These brethren rebaptized all such as joined their, themselves to their congregation. These were Anabaptists. And they became known as Baptists. It's the, these churches of the brethren, some still exist today. And they do have their origins out of Anabaptist churches, just as the uh, Mennonites do. But that does not mean that they all still stand where they ought to stand in relationship to the teachings of the Word of God. We cannot speak to that at this time. Uh, in the future, we hope to, as we deal with each of those different groups as they are in existence even as we will deal with uh, all the other so-called all the Protestant religions that are coming out of Roman Catholicism. And we will deal with all the different Bibles that are introduced in this history. Uh, it goes on to say here, by 1500, they now took such deep root and extended their branches so far, wide, so far and wide that after this settlement, it was impossible to expirate them extirpate them, extra, yeah, impossible to extirpate them. In other words, they couldn't wipe them out. They couldn't, they couldn't root them out because they were so rooted in. There were so many of them. Uh, it says there were 200 congregations of united brethren in Bohemia and Moravia. Many counts, barons, and noblemen joined their churches who built them meeting houses in their cities and villages. These Baptists Go to the Bible, translate it into Bohemian tongue, or in the Bohemian tongue, and or got they got the Bible translated in the Bohemian tongue, and printed at Venice. When the edition was disposed, uh, yeah, uh, they obtained two more printed uh, in Nuremberg. And finding the demand for the Holy Scriptures continued to increase, they established a printing office at Prague, another at Brunswick, Brunswick in Bohemia, and a third at Kreutz. And that's probably a German word which I'm mispronouncing, in Moravia. Uh, where at first they printed nothing but Bohemian Bible. And that being uh, from the history of Baptist by Orchard. Friends, it's strongly set before us here. And yes, the, you know, the, today there are many, you know, we, and I am a King James Bible preacher. Uh, out of the, all the English Bibles, 
This is the only English Bible that is perfectly translated and is the preserved, inspired Word of God. I believe that with all my heart. No other English translation can I say that of. And the Bible haters, the, I might say the King James Bible haters, cannot hold up any one Bible and say, here's the Word of God, it's complete, it's perfect. They don't believe in such a thing. They don't believe such a thing exists. So God has failed them by their own definition. They do not believe the promise of God in here to preserve his word unto all generations. Uh, yes, it's well, settled in heaven, but not on earth. No, that's not, yes, it's settled in heaven, but the guarantee of God is it will be preserved unto all of us. His words. That we might know, if we don't have the word of God, we don't know what to do. And we can't prove what we should do or should not do either. But we do have the Word of God, even as they had the Word of God in their language, in that Bohemian, these Bohemian Bibles. And we say this to tell you that before the King James Bible, yes, there were those six or seven, eight, I think it was, or nine even. Well, if you count the Catholic Bible, I think it's at least nine. Nine English translations that were not right. Not 100% right. Tyndale's work, New Testament, very, very excellent work and as we all know I think it's 85% of our New Testament is Tyndale's work or something like that but uh, of course the Catholic Bible is not worth the pages it's written on but the other translations uh, the the bishops and the deacons and uh, uh, not a deacon's Bible but the bishop's Bible uh, the Geneva Bible those other Bibles Matthew's Bible but all those some of them being done by just one particular person or two, maybe a second person helping there, and then some of the others being done by a particular group of people, like the, the, the bishops done the, the I think it was the Geneva Bible. But you have the group that are done by one person or two, uh, and then the group that are done by a group of people, but specifically by them, and then comes along the King James Bible, where two groups of people that are opposed to each other are commanded of the king to do it. And they are the most scholarly, educated, religious leaders of that day. And there's not any group of them today that can be found compared to that group of people. I'm sorry, just not. I don't care what kind of a high, haughty opinion some of them out there have. No group of them today exists compared to the ones that made this Bible. God used them. That's what. There's no doubt of that. To say, oh, God didn't use them is just to spit in the wind and then to, uh, say God didn't blow it back in your face. Because it's an evident truth he did. Because it flies right back in the face of reason. And the only reason they do are persuaded against it is because they have listened to the lies that have been told. Manuscripts are falsified. Yes. Two manuscripts were falsified, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus, the author of it, very plainly declared, hey, I did that, and the evidence proves that he did. Vaticanus, and again, in both of these, they say go back to the 4th century, I believe it is, the 300s, and that's just not possible. For one, the author of Sinaiticus proves by all his testimony and the testimony of others that he is witness is true that he did create it in the 1800s. And the distinct differences between certain sections of that manuscript, some still being nice and white, and then others, that it's evident that they were deliberately stained by somebody to try to cover up the true age of them. And then Vaticanus has letters and details in it that were not used before the Middle Ages. And it's written over. Every letter's written over again, so it's impossible to date it. Oh, but they will say it's from the 4th century. It's impossible to prove that, friends. Impossible. And they have something in common. The Book of Mark, in both of them, was done by the same hand, the same person. And that book of Mark leaves out the last, uh, I think it says 13 or 20 verses, 13 or so verses of that last chapter of the book of Mark. But all the other witnesses of, witnesses of history prove its existence before 
the third century. And we've spoke of some books over here before that we have, and we've just recently picked up a new book. I'll show this to you real quick here. By John William Bergen. The traditional text of the Holy Gospels. And this man here, the, some other books I referred you to, spoke of him. And I finally have gotten around to getting his books. And brethren, this man lays it out very plain and clear. That the overwhelming testimony of historical writings, both of the Greek and of the other languages, and of what are known as the church fathers, those church early church fathers, as they call them, all their testimony bears the truth that those writings already existed prior to the third century. And even the authors of the book of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus in the book of Mark that wrote that book of Mark with his pen shows that when he copied it, it was right there in front of him in the copy he was copying from. He deliberately chose to leave it out and he left the exact right amount of space to put it in if somebody wanted to which is blatant evidence of his omission of it because he himself personally didn't feel it belonged there. He didn't agree with it, so he left it out. And two men then, and later on in the history, Westcott and Hort, two devil-worshipping, ungodly men who were associated with Catholicism, who were a part of an overall hatred of the truth, created their own Greek text based off those two manuscripts and others. And they used the largest percentage from the Vaticanus. Oh, my friends, the lies that are told against this here King James Bible. Oh, just simple. Any little thing, any little excuse they can find to cast this, that's all. You can't trust it because of this or that. But of all the overwhelming evidence that is set in array against all other modern translations, they all oh, they, they they choke at a gnat that refers to the King James, but the mountain that is condemning the modern versions they swallow wholeheartedly. They do not believe in the God of this Bible. They have drawn eye to him with their mouths and their hearts are far from him. They do not believe the history of the Word of God, and nor do they believe the history of His churches that we existed before the Reformation, and we never came out of Catholicism. Friends, we have one more section next week we're going to deliver to you, and we're going to present to you at that time also another book. Another book that is the documentation, not only of itself, points to the documentation in the records of England itself that shows of a Baptist church that existed in one particular place there that goes all the way back to that 13th century. And Cromwell and his, his men worshipped at that church more than once, I believe it records therein. It had a baptistry, a well-cemented baptistry that it will speak of that was hidden under the floorboards because it was against the law at times in that history to baptize. All oh, them Catholic leaders, them Catholic leaders, even after they had separated themselves as a nation from England or from the Roman Catholicism, those Catholic leaders that got in there that were sympathetic with the Catholic cause were bound to determine to stamp out the rebellion of not only Protestantism, but the Baptists. So at times, yes, it was against the law. Not only was it against the law to have the Bible and read it, but it was against the law to immerse, to baptize. And friends, those that refuse to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I say to you, the ignorant masses out there today that may listen to these videos and just uh, scoff at it and make light of it, friends, the day is coming when you're going to see such horrible things in this world if you live long enough. You're going to see a power rise up in this world which will go forth and kill and conquer. And they will. They will. Anyone who is not willing to take a name, a number, a symbol, and associate themselves with that power 
will be put to death by cutting off of your head. And the world will praise it. The world will champion them to go forth and do this. That will be during the Great Tribulation. And the Antichrist will be at the head of that movement, that army. And he will oppose all truth and righteousness. And he will exalt himself as God in that rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And he will make the agreement with them. He'll make the agreement with Israel. And yes, I believe with those uh, Muslim countries over there. He'll make it possible for Israel to have her temple. And he'll make it possible for Palestine to have its temple. So I don't know how that's going to happen now, but he, I believe that's what's going to happen. He's going to satisfy all sides as a great leader. And then someone will try to kill him. He'll receive an injury to the head. And it'll appear, oh, he's dead. He can't survive that. But he will miraculously recover. Oh, then's when he's going to demonstrate powers, which he did not before show or have. Because the demons will have, the demon will have entered into him, and he will present himself as God. He'll enter into that temple that he helped them build. He'll enter into it, the Holy of Holies. He'll enter in and say, I am God. Worship me. And as I've said before, I'm of the opinion, too, that he'll probably use the ideal of evolution. That he, he evolved into that being that he is now, he is, or says he is. And he has his forerunner, according to scriptures, he has his false prophet to foretell of his coming. Even as John the Baptist was the forerunner to Christ, the Antichrist will have his forerunner also. And the devil will give him power, and God will allow him to have power, he'll allow him to do things that have never before been done. He'll be able to call down fire. He'll be able to command statues to move and talk and to point to him as the true and living God. All oh, you scoffers, you that make light of these things which we set before you, not only of history, but of the Word of God. The day is coming when I believe that you know, the, the true Christians, the true ones that are truly saved, I believe in a rapture, my friends. The Bible speaks of people working together in the field. Some are taken, some are left behind, still alive now. Working in the meals, grinding the meal and bread, working together, some taken, some left behind. And of those that live together, sleeping in the beds together even, some taken, some left behind. Friends, that is a rapture. That's a taking out of your midst of a fellow worker who was right over there a moment ago, and now they're gone. Well, where'd they go? Rapture. Oh, there's no such rapture in the Bible, they say. And then you get down to those, oh, it's just all going to happen once. One general rapture, one general resurrection is all over. No. Resurrection of the just, and resurrection of the unjust, a thousand years apart. But see, there's the day of the Lord, which is at the end of the end of the millennial reign, but the day of redemption is before it. And also the rapture. Complicated details. We've preached on those things in other videos. You can find them. Friends, next week we will speak to you of the Baptist Church at Hillcliff and of her history and what she is to us. May God bless and keep you, my friends, till we meet again.